But the board gang escaped. They escaped from this cell block that was built specifically to hold them. And the way they did it was, their secret weapon was, their, first of all, their charm and their charisma, and also their intelligence. So they ended up making friends with the guards, to the point where the guards would actually pull in a metal card table right in the middle of where you guys are standing, and let the, let the gang out of the cells, and let them play cards with each other. Now one day, one of the gang members, he grabbed the guard's skeleton key and then he handed it back to him immediately. You know, they had really won the guard's trust at this time, so you know, he was able to play it off like he was just joking. He grabbed the key, handed it back to him, but what the guard didn't realize was that in said gang member's hand, he had a piece of soap. And he pressed down so hard on this piece of soap that it actually created an imprint of the key's <laughs> intricate design on the piece of soap. So, you know, a skeleton key would have opened all four of these cells, right? So after the guard left that night, they took that imprint of the piece of soap and then they ripped off a piece of metal from the same card table and they managed to fashion a brand new working skeleton key. And so they would actually let themselves out at night, timing the guards' hourly checks and when they knew, when they, knew the guards weren't going to be in this section of the jail for a while, they'd let themselves out at night. And you see this window over here? See how it's got three layers of bars? Yeah. Well, two of those layers of bars are post board game escape. <laughs> Okay, so at the time there's only one layer of bars, so they must have had access to another hack cell plate or something like that. I don't quite know what they used to get at the second time, but they would let themselves out at night using the same card table to reach the window, resourceful. They cut a hole into the bars and they escaped again. Now, as you can imagine, this was a huge news story. Um, you know, a little bit of trivia. It was the subject of the very first CBC news broadcast in Toronto, hosted by Lauren Green, who, you know, before he rose to fame on Bonanza, he was known in Canada as the voice of doom because he was like a newscaster with a deep, you know, serious voice. So, you know, it was a huge news story. The board gang had escaped again, and there were all these rumors that they had been seen, you know, like in different parts of the province or like hopping a train to the prairies or something like that, right? People's imaginations ran wild. But the fact of the matter is, the reality is, uh, you know, the gang had sort of, so to speak, shot themselves in the foot when they, they murdered the policemen because now the public was a lot less willing to cover for them. I mean, there are all these stories during their previous escape attempt that probably not true, you never know, that they would be seen up next to someone's cottage at a cottage of their own, uh, you know, hanging hundred dollar bills out to dry after they'd gone swimming in the lake. And of course, back then, no one was going to, you know, rat on the board gang because everyone loved them. But now, they're very much hiding from the public as well as from the police. So, uh, the board gang was captured only eight days later, which was a very uh, short amount of time for these guys who are usually so good at evading the police. They were captured only eight days later. Uh, three of the guys, the two Jacksons and Boyd, were found in, a, in an abandoned farm at Leslie and Shepherd, and Stu Chan was found in a nearby building. They're tired, they're hungry, they're cold, they're brought back here, and, um, you know, the superintendent at the time was fired because it was his bright idea to put these four mastermind criminals in cells next to each other where they, they could conspire with each other just by shouting from one cell to the next. The first thing that the new superintendent did was install two extra layers of, layers of bars on that window there, and just to make sure board gang, they didn't do anything really embarrassing like escaping from the dock the third time. The two guys that were in the car when the policeman was killed, Su Chan and Lenny Jackson, they were finally hanged. So they were hanged in 52, like I said the last two guys hanged were in 62, so they were almost the last two. They were two of the last people ever hanged here. So we just, sorry, we just made the trek from the gallows to here. And of course, you know, hopefully it was a very fun or at least informative track. For them, it would have been the exact opposite. If you can put your put yourself in the state of mind of the men, of the people being hanged, they were hanged at midnight. According to reports, Lenny Jackson was very, very nervous on his day of execution. A little bit of trivia, he was born Jewish, he converted to Anglicanism um, later on in his life, but just before he died, he became a Catholic, joining Su Chen. So he was escorted to the gallows with a rosary around his neck. Oh, and they had taken away his wooden leg because, you know, just in case he tried smuggling a chainsaw or like a samurai sword in the next thing, right? So they took away his one leg, so he, and it's in the, co the police museum at College in Bay right now, if anyone wants to see it, it's on full display. So he hobbled to the gallows on one leg, on one foot, escorted by guards, he said nothing. But Su Chen, he was supposedly the violent one. He was the slightly unhinged one. Uh, he was the one that actually shot uh, the police officer. 
he was very uh, confident, almost cocky on his day of execution. I mean, he joked with the guards, he casually read from Tolstoy's War and Peace, and when he finally got to the gallows and met the executioner, he joked, he said, you know, is it true that hanging is really as quick and as painless as everyone says it is? And ironically for him, it really wasn't. He took 44 minutes to die. So he is actually the record uh, longest, you know, the rec that was the record length of time for anyone to die at the dawn jail. As for the other two guys, uh, Boyd and Willie Jackson, they received concurrent life sentences, these kind of things, so they're, you know, but they were both paroled in 66 for good behavior. So um, they only ended up spending another 15 years in prison. I don't know what happened to Willie Jackson. Maybe he went back to the circus. But as for Boyd, uh, he changed his name and he moved to British Columbia and he lived out the rest of his life until 2002. And he died at the age of 88. Yep. And he would do interviews on CBC and stuff like that, talking about you know his crimes, always with his face blurred out because of course it would be detrimental to his standing and you know his community. People knew that he was Canada's most infamous criminal.